Hello, I'd like to talk to you about the effects of Islam upon Christianity. This is a subject that if you go to a seminary or any other school you won't be taught anything about. But it turns out that Islam has shaped Christianity in ways that very few people suspect or know. When you look at the church today, it seems to be rather lost in terms of its political future. Example. Here in Nashville, Tennessee, which is called the buckle on the Bible belt, and if that is the case, I say that the church's pants are down around its ankles, the Muslim Brotherhood finds the broadest door into our society to be the door of the church. Churches do not resist or oppose Islam, and indeed, they will go to Family of Abraham religious dialogue events and sit there and smile as Muslims tell them how much they love Christians. And then they turn right around and ignore the fact that Christians are being slaughtered on an everyday basis in Africa and in the Middle East. We're hearing a lot about Syrian refugees now. What we don't hear anything about is that these Syrian refugees include Christians. So there's no political pressure in America to bring persecuted Christians to America, only the Muslims. Now the Muslims are very equipped for this political pressure because they, they operate as a unit. The 57 members of the OIC, the Organization of Islamic Cooperation, are the ones who determine who comes to America. Now, the, So the Muslims pick and choose who comes to America and the churches sit around and smile. Why is this? Well it turns out there's some reasons, some very ancient reasons that go back to the very beginning of Islam. And that's what this talk is about, to explain to you how history has shaped the church today to the point where it has become timid and afraid. How do you explain this map? How did Islam begin to dominate? We have to understand that North Africa used to be Christian, Iraq used to be Christian, Persia was half Christian, Egypt. So all of these countries used to be Christian and more, and yet they're not today. How did this happen? precisely what had to happen for this to take place. This is what we're going to learn in this lecture, because it is the creation of the Islamic lands that is what drives the church today to be what it is, timid, ignorant, and unwilling to learn. Now you've heard it said that the Roman Empire collapsed because of the German tribes that invaded, and then somehow another classical civilization just began to disappear. But we can see here at this time, the Rome has collapsed, but that the Byzantine Empire, which is centered in Constantinople and today what we call Turkey, was pulling together a political empire again. This is a map that shows the conquest of Islam 25 years after the death of Muhammad. In the next slide, slide 5, we can once again see the heavy inroads that Islam is making into what was formerly a Christian world. Here we see in this slide how much happened in 100 years. This is an amazing conquest. Let's examine it in a little more detail. This whole talk is based upon recent archaeological work and in particular a book about the rise of the European economy in which archaeology is used to bring together history. This is archaeology of beneath the waters of the Mediterranean, archaeology on the land surrounding the Mediterranean, but then also another peculiar kind of archaeology, which is the translation of old documents, so they've been put in a database format. It was this that intrigued me when I read this book, and so I put together, not from the appendix, it had a lot of battles which I'd never heard of, so this was the first part of my battle list. I then went to the web and completed the search and found 548 battles that Islam had fought against the Christian world and the Buddhist world and the Hindu world in the over 1200 years. Now we're faced with a problem on how do we portray the information of 548 battles. And so I created a concept which I call a dynamic battle map, which allows us to see the spread of Islam as a measure of time. So here we go. The red dots or past battles, the white dots are battles that are being fought in the current period. Now we're going to compress 1,200 years of loss and grief into two minutes here. Notice how the spread heads out immediately across the waters of the Mediterranean. Usually when we think of jihad in the classical days, we think of desert fighting. But here we can see that Islam has mastered the art of naval warfare and is using the Mediterranean to apply force throughout all of Europe. 
there's going to be some 200 battles fought in Spain alone. Now, why are these battles relentless? Why do they go on and on? Well, it is the way of Muhammad. In the last nine years of his life, Muhammad was involved in 100 different jihad events. And we can see how this constant ongoing jihad was part of the effort that brought down classical civilization. And here we are in the final slide in which we can see the destruction of all classical civilization, Persian, Greek, and Roman. Now then, this dynamic battle map has showed you the quantity of warfare, but now then I would like to give you the quality of warfare. So here's what we're going to do. I've put together slides which contain, as it were, the newspaper headlines. Of course, there were no newspapers then, but we can think of them as the headlines in the media of the day. We start off in the 7th century. We have the destruction of the Jazima tribe by Khalid. Then we have the Khalid at the Battle of Oasis, Iraq, where many Christians were destroyed. We have the episode of his rapes. And then we have the episode of Umar's conquest of Jerusalem, which made Christians and Jews demis. Now, there's one of these Khalid, the sword of Allah. There's one of these rapes that I want to tell you about in detail because it illustrates the fact that rape was to come as it had been in Muhammad's day an ongoing constant of jihad. After the battle, the chieftain of the losing side was brought in front of Khalid and his head was cut off and the blood was allowed to soak into the ground. He then brought forth the captain's or the chieftain's wife and he raped her on the ground and held the blood of her husband. Now before this, there had been at the battle of Oasis that Khalid brought forth every defeated and captured soldier put him in a dry stream bed and cut off their heads. It was said they cut off heads until blood actually ran down the dry stream bed. Here Islam has turned to the east and there's an attack on Hindustan. 26,000 Hindus are slaughtered. In Armenia, the nobles are herded into a church and burned. And in Ephesus, 7,000 Greeks were enslaved. Now you will notice here that this slide says golden age. Keep up with this because as you will see, the Golden Age was not so golden. Indeed, it was marked by the fact that Kafirs, non-Muslims, suffered in an ongoing way. The ninth century Golden Age. The Caliph ordered all new churches destroyed. In Amorium, there were massive enslavement of Greeks. And then, in the ninth century, under the Golden Age, the Egyptian Christians, the Copts, revolted over the Jizya. Now, the Jizya was the demi-tax. Now, Muslims actually have the gall to say that the Christians were delighted when they invaded Egypt. But isn't it odd that these same people who are so delighted are now having a riot over the payment of excessive taxation? 10th century, it's still the Golden Age. In Thessalonica, 22,000 Christians are enslaved. In Seville, Spain, Christians are massacred. 30,000 churches are destroyed in Egypt and Syria. In the 11th century, and we're still in the Golden Age, 6,000 Jews in Morocco are killed, hundreds of Jews in Cordoba are killed, 4,000 Jews of Granada are killed, and in Georgia and Armenia they were invaded. In Hindustan, 15,000 were killed with a half million enslaved. 
Now notice this is still in the Golden Age. Moving to the next century, in Yemen, Jews are offered a conversion or death. The Christians of Granada were deported to Morocco, and in India, many cities were destroyed and they were offered to convert or die. In one town alone, 20,000 Hindus are enslaved. 13th century, still the Golden Age. In India, 50,000 Hindu slaves are freed by conversion. These men, these Hindus, were able to gather their freedom only by converting to Islam first. You see, the slavery was a benefit to Islam because not only could they work you and get your labor, but if you wanted to be freed, the only way to be freed as a slave was to become a Muslim. So slavery was excellent for converting Kafirs to Muslim. Buddhist monks were butchered. Nuns were raped in what we now call Afghanistan. In Damascus and Safid, there was Christian mass murder. And the Jews of Marrakesh were massacred. In Tabriz, there was forced conversion of Jews. Now then, in the 14th century, and we're still in the Golden Age, Cairo riots, once again, the poor cops, churches are burned, the Jews of Tabriz are forced to convert, Tamerlane in India kills as many as 90,000 in one day, and in India 30,000 were massacred in cold blood, and Taluk took 180,000 slaves. Now this is the 14th century and still the Golden Age. Notice how the Kafirs are treated. And by, when I keep bringing up this Golden Age, remember, we're told endlessly that the Golden Age was the high point of all human civilization. Not so golden, really, eh? Tamerlane in India devastates 700 villages. Tamerlane annihilated Nestorian and Jacobite Christians. And after 700 years of attacks, Islam captures and destroys Constantinople. Now, we're beginning to see here one of the effects of Islam. You've probably never heard of the Nestorian church, nor have you heard of the Jacobite church. Yet these were ancient churches in the Middle East, and they were now annihilated and destroyed by Islam. Islam is going to totally change Christianity. 17th century. The Jews of Yemen and Persia are forced to convert, forced conversions of Greek Christians to Islam, and in Persia the Zoroastrian persecution is increased, and in India, 600,000 Hindus are killed by Aurangzeb. Now before we move on to the 18th century, I want to mention to you about Zoroastrianism. Zoroastrianism is a culture and a religion that has never gotten a fair shake in history, but it is about to be destroyed and annihilated within Persia. In the 18th century, Zoroastrian persecution was intense. The Jews of Jeddah and Arabia were expelled. The Jews of Morocco were massacred, and the Hindu persecution continues. Forced conversion of Jews in, in Iran. This is in the 19th century. Jews of Baghdad are massacred. Nearly 250,000 Armenian Christians are slaughtered in Turkey. This is in the 19th century. And now then the Zoroastrians are completely annihilated. And now we come to the 20th century, the century in which I was born, in which there are a million Armenians who are going to be killed. How many Christians know about this? How many Christians know about the details of exactly how this happened? It was torturous death. Christians murdered simply because they were Christian. So those are the deaths in the centuries, including that of the Golden Age. Now then, let's take a look at the classical Mediterranean civilization. One of the things we have to do here is to point out that the Mediterranean was the center of civilization in the classical period. We think of continents and political domination, and that's how we name things. But in these days, the Mediterranean was the glue that bonded everything together. Egypt, for instance, was not so much an African nation as it was a Mediterranean nation. And in the same, the North Africa was part of the, uh, part of the Mediterranean civilization as well. There were reasons for this. It took 10 days to sail from Carthage, North Africa, to Italy. By land, it took 140 days. Shipping a ton of grain from Egypt to Rome cost the same amount as shipping it 75 miles by ox cart. Said another way, Transportation on the Mediterranean was cheap and simple compared to that of hauling it over land. Under the Roman rule, the sea was free of danger to trade. And as an indication of how valuable Mediterranean trade was, there were as many as 500 boats in the harbor in Constantinople at one time. Before Islam, when Rome wanted to communicate with France, it did so with a letter on a ship. 
However, after the Mediterranean became a dangerous place to be on a ship if you were a Kaffir, they instead sent it over the Alps. A plague that started in Iraq would took four years to get to Constantinople, but before Islam it only took four months. Now this, of course, is a repetitive sort of plague. Ibn Khaldun, the Christians could not float a plank on the inland sea, that is the Mediterranean. Europe was impoverished economically and culturally isolated. Islam preyed upon all the Christian ships that were in the Mediterranean. This was not unusual. This is an economic form of warfare, and Muhammad always involved economic targets if he possibly could. Now the actual statistics are is that 90% of the Christian trade collapsed. I want you to imagine the city you're living in and that the trucks and trains and planes that come in are reduced by 90% so that you have only 10% of the traffic. What would happen to the economy in your area? Well, of course, it would collapse. We've all heard of the Dark Ages, and they're sort of mysterious as to why they existed. It's just sort of like Europeans suddenly lost the ability to read and write. But what we have is there are three Dark Ages. There's the Dark Age in Europe, a dark age in Byzantine or Asia Minor, or what we call Turkey today, and then another dark age in North Africa. So there are three dark ages, which is a clue because there's a common cause. Here we see a picture of an architectural ruin in North Africa. In Rome, the Roman buildings were slowly harvested of their marble. That is, people lived there and they used the ancient Roman structures for a source of new marble. But the Invasion of North Africa was so rapid and so severe that the people were slaughtered to the degree where there was no one around to take and use the ancient buildings, and so therefore they were preserved. This process of invasion of North Africa created the desert that we now know in North Africa. Before Islam, there was farming done by the Christians in North Africa. But when Islam invaded, they were not farmers. They raised sheep and goats. They grazed on the Christian fields because they could, and this destroyed the, the grass and crops. Because goats in particular will do this. But it's more than that. Since the invading Muslims were not big on farming, they really didn't help to maintain the irrigation system. This process of desertification was so intense that there's a layer of silt in the harbors in North Africa. This layer of silt comes from the erosion produced by the devastation of Islam invading North Africa. Since 90% of the economy was destroyed, what economy was left? Well, it was the economy of furs, lumber, swords, and slaves. This is pretty bare bones living, and this is not something that people want to brag about. That is, Christians are not wanting to brag about the fact that their ancestors were forced to crude trade and in including that of human life. But this was the necessity of the Dark Ages the Dark Ages produced by Islamic invasion. The establishment says that the loss of civilization in Europe had nothing to do with Islam at all. It was those Romans who were invaded by the German tribes. But you know, the German tribes wanted to become Roman. They weren't there to destroy Rome. The establishment also tells us that Islam was a force for good because of its golden age and how it preserved Greek and Roman learning. Question, why do they need to preserve it? Oh, that's right, they destroyed so much in Europe that they were not even capable of preserving their own writings. So that which is viewed as a plus of Islam, actually what we're looking at is a destructive force. The data shows us that the collapse of European civilization and the production of the Dark Ages was caused by Islam. This is radical new way of thinking. Classical civilization of the Greeks and Romans was annihilated by jihad and replaced by Islamic civilization. Christianity was forever changed. I now want to talk to you about another misunderstood aspect of European history, and that is the Crusades. In America, the Crusades tend to be presented as rich French and European knights who decided to invade the Middle East for the purpose of power and money. But that is not the case at all. Islam had destroyed 30,000 churches under one caliph. Christians and Jews under Islamic rule were dhimmis, that is, they were semi-slaves. We'll talk about that more later. And many, many instances of brutality against Christians, including rape. Christians were leaving the Middle East, and the Byzantine emperor pled for help to the pope. 
Now this is the world that the Pope and Europeans looked out to see. All the invasion, which is now the Islam is the green area, and all the battles that have been fought up to now. So it was possible if you were sitting in Rome to imagine that all of Christianity would disappear, and so therefore the Crusades were called. Now then, I want to make a direct comparison between the battles of the Crusades in this next slideshow, and this is done in the same time frame. Every tick of the clock is a 20-year period. And what we can see is, is that the, when we compare the battles of Jihad against the battles of the Crusades, there's hardly any comparison at all. The Crusades were defensive and lasted 300 years, and they ended 800 years ago. Jihad was offensive and has lasted for 1400 years, and it's active today. Somewhere, if you're watching this video, someone died because they were Kafir and the murderer was a Muslim. Now, so therefore, is this actually moral equivalence? I don't think so at all. Now, the history taught in our establishment university says that Islam was nothing but a force for good, that indeed it produced two golden ages, a golden age in Baghdad and a golden age in Spain, or as they prefer to call it, Andalus. Here, let's take a look in this dynamic battle map of what is happening to Spain, which was a Christian nation. First off, you need to know that there were roughly 200 battles fought in Spain, and these were all defensive because the Muslims had invaded in the year 711. So how golden is this? Not so much, I think. At least that much warfare. The other thing you have to ask yourself the question is if being under the rule of Muslims in Spain was so wonderful, why is it that the Christians fought for 700 years to throw them out? Just ask yourself that question. Could it have been that good? So is this a multicultural golden age or a reign of terror? There was no Islamic golden age in Spain, at least not the way we're told about. Every Christian and every Jew was a demi, that is a semi-slave. There was actual slavery, constant war. Now the elites had it good. We know this from any invading army, that there will be those in the country that's invaded who are willing to serve the conquerors, and they can live well for it. So there were flecks of gold in Spain. I'm not trying to say it was all negative, but there was so much negativity and pain and suffering that it's really hard to call it a golden age. It was golden only for a very few. Now then, let's deal with the golden age in Baghdad and let's use the same thing. We're gonna use the dynamic battle map here, which you're watching now, to see all of the attacks that went on during the age of the golden age of Baghdad. Why are we told this? Why is this much ongoing suffering, war, and jihad told to us as though it's a wonderful thing? And by the way, notice that most of this is directed to the Christians. Now we have to hand the Muslims this. They also attack the Hindus and the Buddhists as well. The Golden Age of Baghdad. Christians and Jews were semi-slaves. Christian women were used as sex slave. As a scientist, I'm telling you this was a disaster. Islamic philosophy denied the existence of physical laws and cause and effect. Islam destroyed about 90% about of all classical work. You know how we're told how wonderful it was that it preserved? It only preserved about 10%. The other 90% was destroyed. And all of that translation work that we hear about, that was all done by Christians and Jews. And here we see the Islamic world today and how it came about. The dynamic battle map only went to the year 1922, but jihad did not stop in 1922. This information is a database found on the religionofpeace.com, 
and I've taken and done quite a bit of work with it to bring out how these, how many thousand is this? 19,000 jihad attacks since 9-11-2001. You can see they're scattered all over the world, but you can see where they're centered. The closer you are to the Middle East, the more you are to have to suffer. Here we have a plot of jihad attacks versus time, and we notice it ebbs and flows. But there's something of interest here. Notice that there's about twice as many jihad attacks against other Muslims as there are against Christians, Buddhists, Jews, and atheists. Now why is this? We well, see there's two kinds of jihad. There's jihad against the Kafir, and then there's jihad of purification. When the first caliph came about, Abu Bakr, the first thing he did was to declare war against the apostates, the people who wanted to leave Islam. Or they were hypocrites. They were not strong Muslims. So therefore, there's a kind of jihad which I call the jihad of purification, and that's what we're seeing here. So for every kafir that dies, two Muslims have died in the, ever since 9-11. We can see that jihad is relentless. It's against kafirs and impure Muslims, and jihad will adapt, but it will always be there. So I took the top four countries and plotted them up here. They're Israel, India, Thailand, and the Philippines. But, although these were the top four countries, we need to go to the next slide to see the jihad tax per 100 people. This means that we can compare India to Israel. But notice here what we find. We find that we have Jews, Buddhists, Christians, and Hindus who are all being attacked. Therefore, the jihad is not just against the Christians, but against all religions. Now, by the way, there's bad news for people who are secularist or atheist and think, well, we're not involved in all this business of jihad. Well, it turns out the doctrine of jihad is harder on the atheists than it is on Christians or Jews. So much for that. The religion of peace which, by the way, seems to be a term coined by George Bush. All of this data, 548 battles, 19,000 jihad attacks, all follows the doctrine of jihad. I've counted in the 1,400 years of Islam that there are 12 decades in 1,400 years that are jihad-free. Said another way, we could say that Islam is 91% violence and 9% peace. So if you say Islam is a religion of peace, as George Bush did, you get a score of nine. Now, if you're in my class, and I was a college professor, if you make nine on a quiz, it's 100 points, you fail. So George Bush, you fail. Islam is not the religion of peace. Well, or at least it's 91% wrong. Constant violence is normal. Why is this? We see that all of Islam is founded on Quran, Sirah, Hadith. Now, the Quran everyone has heard about, even if they haven't read it. The Sirah is the biography of Muhammad, and the Hadith are his traditions. Muhammad is important because 91 verses in the Quran say that every Muslim is to imitate Muhammad in every detail. So therefore, the biography and words of Muhammad are all sacred text. What we can see here is that Islam is this much Allah, 14%, and this much Muhammad, 86%. So, this is the doctrine of Islam, these three books. We see here the amount of text devoted to the Kafir. Basically, 51% of the doctrine of Islam is concerned with the Kafir. What this means is, is Islam is primarily a political ideology, not a religion. Here's how much is devoted to the concept of jihad. And we can see that all three texts, Quran, Sirah, and Hadith, all address jihad, and by quite a bit. 31% of the total doctrine is jihad. Now, how important was jihad in Muhammad's day? Well, here we have a growth curve of Muhammad's success, and he preached the religion for 13 years in Mecca and persuaded 150 Muslims to become Arab. He went to Medina, where he averaged an event of jihad once a month for the last nine years of his life, and this was very successful. When he died, every Arab in the Arabian Peninsula was a Muslim. 
So what we see here is was religion of Islam was not successful, but jihad was overwhelmingly successful. Now we have one more chart. Notice we have something here. I call this the law of Islamic saturation. This is in Turkey. Turkey, when Islam invaded, was Christian. Today it is only 0.3% Christian. This is what I call Islamic saturation. Notice that this curve takes centuries to fulfill, but in the end, once Islam has invaded Christianity, whatever religion is there, Buddhist or Hindu, will all disappear and it will all become Islamic. It just takes time, it takes centuries, but it always ends this way. It's interesting, but I'm the first person who's ever asked this question. How many people died in the jihad over 1400 years? Well, these figures are approximate, but we can see here in this table I call the tears of jihad, we have 60 million Christians, 80 million Hindus, 10 million Buddhists, and 120 million Africans. And this does not include the Zoroastrians. This is what I call the tears of jihad. Now, why is it that Christians don't teach themselves that 60 million of them died under jihad? Why is this information almost forbidden to be known? I say that doctrine drives history and that history shows the true nature of political Islam. Political Islam is the enemy of all Kafir civilizations and that political Islam is permanent and unchanging. There are three great pivots to Christianity in which massive changes took place. Once it became a Roman religion, then we have the invasion of Islam, and then we have the Protestant Reformation in Europe. These are the three great pivots. Unfortunately, Islam is not taught that I know of in any school as being one of the great changers of Christianity. Islam subjugated the very heart of Christianity, the Holy Land, and they annihilated different forms of Christianity. Islam annihilated central government by jihad. This meant that the Catholic Church was the only European organization left to educate and administrate across borders. Islam produced a politicized Catholic Church. This, once again, is not very well recognized. Now let's see some other changes that Islam brought about. In the year 632, Islam had no images. A century later, the Greek Orthodox Church stopped the use of icons after repeated losses to Islam. The reasoning went like this. We're losing. We're doing something wrong. The Muslims forbid images. We'll forbid images too to see if that will help us. Witches and demons, early 11th century. Europeans went to Islamic Spain and studied sorcery, alchemy, and astrological text. They became familiar with the Hadith. In 1487, the Catholic Church issues the doctrine of the witch's hammer. So where did the Christians learn about witchcraft and all of these things? Well, they learned it from the Muslims in Spain. Now then, mass killing of Jews. In the year 624, there was mass murder of Jews by Muhammad. In 1011, mass murder in Cordoba by Islam. In 1033, mass murder in Fez by Islam. And then after that, 1096, there was mass murder in Germany by Christians. Notice that I'm saying here that some very bad things had happened. Their initial impetus was found in that of Islam. The doctrine of war. In the year 623, the jihad doctrine was, came about in Medina. In the year 650, Christians introduced holy war ideas, but it was not until the year 1063 that the Catholic doctrine of holy or war was finalized. In the early 7th century, apostasy and heresy were made capital crimes in Islam. In the early 12th century, apostasy and heresy became capital crimes in Christianity. Then we have the Inquisition. The first Islamic Inquisition was in the early 12th century. The Catholic Inquisition was in the late 12th century. What I'm saying here is, is that Islam influenced and a greatly battered church in Europe. Now, let's see Islam in America today. Here in Nashville, Tennessee, liberal Christians love to go to Family of Abraham dialogues in which they are told that Muslims, Christians, and Jews are all members of the Family of Abraham and they're all, blood, they're all basically brothers and sisters. We find that there's professional ignorance by church leaders. You cannot imagine how ignorant 
Christians are about the doctrine of Islam here in Nashville. And by the way, they'll do everything they can to praise Islam. We have the movement of Chrislam in which there are now Bibles being produced in which nothing that would offend Islam is being published. That is, there are Christians who are willing to Islamicize the church and then declare happiness and peace. You'll find Christians who will actually say, well, Christians and Muslims all worship the same God. Really? Anyone who's read the Quran who could say that? Well, of course, they've not really read the Quran. Either that or they're cowards and know the truth and are not willing to speak it. The establishment Christians are apologists. If it's at a university, they don't teach the truth of the destruction of the church by Islam. ISNA is the Muslim Brotherhood organization. These are partners with ISNA. The, you can read them here. Evangelical Lutheran Church, Presbyterian Church, USA, Union for Reform Judaism, U.S. Conference of Catholic Bishops, United Methodist Church, and Unitarian Universalist Association. This comes from ISNA's website. What about our own intellectual history? Slide 76. For 1400 years, we never used Muslim or Islam. They're called Arabs, Turks, Moors, Al-Qaeda, Asian, or Saracen, but never Muslim. The other thing that's odd about our intellectual history is there's no common knowledge. The knowledge of Islam has always been by specialists. I mean, who do you know that's an expert on Islam? And yet I'll bet you know some who, who's a professional accountant, surgeon, dentist, lawyer. But how come we don't know anyone who really knows about Islam? Have you noticed how little there is to be known amongst people? For 1400 years, we've refused to study Islam. Why don't our schools teach Muhammad and the history of jihad? How come Islam is always portrayed as the wonderful golden age of Islam, which preserved all learning and was the high point of civilization? Why is this? Why have we remained ignorant and why are we still suffering? Now the modern denial is, well, PC sensitivity and people are afraid of being called a bigot and then there are those who are just afraid of being harmed. Well, let's say we accept those as true. What about the previous 1300 years? There was no political correctness then. But we are no more critical of Islam today than we were yesterday. So why is this? My wife and I used to talk about this and one night I said, you know, the church has become like an abused wife. And my wife went in and did some research and came up with the YWCA handbook of rape and sexual abuse. It's a counseling handbook. And we went through all the points and notice how well these display the mind of the Christian today. The traumatized mind. Kafirs accept violence and threats from Islam without protest. We deny the suffering caused by political Islam and accept political Sharia. Violent molestation causes denial. The victim denies the attacks. The media reports very little about jihad and never connects the dots. And the churches deny the suffering of Christians. To me, this is one of the most tragic. Fear is the tool that the abuser uses to control the victims. Today, we're always afraid about what Islam will do. And this particular slide was put together when there was an amateur video made and it created a riot in North Africa. Guilt. The victim finds a way to blame himself or herself. This manifests in the form of, well, we just haven't treated the Muslims well enough. If we'll treat them well, well, they'll be kind and generous to us. Branded. The victim does not want others to find out. What church today brags about the fact that Christian women have been made sex slaves? None. We cover up the damage done by Islam in order not to face it. The victim feels shamed and the abuse is hard to talk about. Well, how much do Christians want to talk about this dreadful slaughter over the centuries? Well, not at all, actually. Anger. The angry, anger turns inward. Have you noticed since 9-11 here in America how politics has become personally vicious? People no longer to talk about so much about ideas but assassinate character. And this is what it's done, for instance, for me. No one says that I'm wrong, they just say I'm a bigot and a hater and Islamophobe. American politics has been changed by the introduction of Islam. Now we have powerlessness. Things will not get better. 
pessimism about Islam prevails. How many times have you heard people say negative things that are pessimistic about Islam? Well, we can't do anything about it. Now let's look at the abuser. Denial, the abuser defends the, denies the abuse. For instance, Turkey absolutely denies the Armenian genocide. Inadequacy, abusers are arrogant and overly self-confident. <laughs> Trust me with this one. If you deal with Muslims, you'll discover that Islam is perfect. It is never wrong. It has never made a single mistake. There's never, everything with Islam is just hunky-dory and fabulous. Domination. While the very word Islam means submission, and the abuser expects submission on the part of the abused, the kafir. For instance, when the Muslims went to the auditoriums at Georgetown University and told them that they didn't like the crosses in the auditorium, they expected Georgetown to do exactly what it did, which was to take them down and to cover them up. They expect it because that's what they're used to getting. Christians just don't push back against Muslims, so anything they ask to do, it happens. Manipulation. The abuser wants to make the victim feel guilty. Notice after every jihad attack, the Muslims say, oh, we're concerned about blowback. Oh, we're concerned now about people hating Muslims because Muslims have killed them. Really? After 1,400 years of jihad, brutality, enslavement, theft, deception, rape, annihilation, and insults, the Kafir mind and the mind of the Christian has become identical with that of an abused victim. This has to change or Christianity will be completely annihilated. You don't think so? Well, what happened to Christianity in Iraq? What happened to Christianity in North Africa? What happened to Christianity in Turkey? It'll all go. The plan is underway. Islam is here. Conclusion. Christians must face their shameful, brutal, degrading history under Islam. We must face our fears. Some things have to change. One of these is Christians must learn to stand up for the persecuted Christians. Right now we're getting Muslims to come to America who are, they say, refugees from Syria. Where are the Christians? Why are we bringing in Muslims before we do Christians? Well, I'll tell you why because the churches don't raise a stink about it. Every candidate who runs for office, whether it's dog catcher or president, needs to be asked, what are you going to do about keeping the persecuted Christians out of America? We seem to have a home for every Muslim who wants to come here. When will we find a home for the persecuted church? This has to change. Something else the churches have to do. Some Christians who are not predisposed towards acquiescing to Islam need to go to events like Family of Abraham events and stand up and ask difficult questions of the Muslims. Don't just smile and believe everything they say. Changes have to come about. Christians have to educate themselves as to how the church has been brutally transformed by Islam. Christians have a lot of work to do, and it evolves around education. For instance, another thing that Christians have to face is, is that the Great Commission is not being used against Muslims much here in America. Christians need to learn how to apply the Great Commission to Muslims. And it doesn't start with preaching Jesus or the Gospels. Here's why. It doesn't work very well because you see every Muslim has already heard about Jesus because Jesus is in his Quran. And Jesus is not the Jesus of the Christian. So when Christians start talking to Muslims about Jesus, the Muslims are like, hey, he wasn't even the final prophet. And he was just a prophet, uh, that's all he was. The Gospels, well, the Gospels are corrupt because you see the Christians corrupted them because Originally, Jesus' main purpose was to prophesy the coming of Muhammad. Christians have to understand that to convert a Muslim, you must first take away his Muhammad and you must take away his Quran. Now, I don't mean reach and grab him, but I do mean that you have to become skillful in taking him away by telling a Muslim what he is in those books, because they don't understand that. I have a book written by Ibn, edited by Ibn Warwick, and it's about called Leaving Islam. In almost every case, the Muslim left Islam because of when they found out who Muhammad was and who Allah was. So the churches have a lot of work to do, and if they're to become skillful, they have to master the knowledge of the Quran, the Sirah, and the Hadith. Christians have to tend to their own. Christian women have to be told what a Sharia marriage is, and so if you're going to date a Muslim, here's what's going to happen. Another thing that needs to happen is this, is that the churches must learn what the word Dawah, D-A-W-A-H, means. Because you see, Christian teenagers are being converted by Muslims because they have a way to do it. It's called dawah. You can buy books on how to convert Christians. 
So the churches must wise up and toughen up and smarten up because if we do not, what happened in Turkey will happen here in America. What can't happen in America? Really? Thank you for listening.